Every now and again, a serious philosophy sweeps belatedly into intellectual fashion, usually as a result of some particular set of circumstances. Between the two world wars, this happened to Marxism, mainly as a result of the Russian Revolution. After the Second World War, it happened to existentialism, the fashion for which began on the continent of Europe in response largely to the experience of Nazi occupation. When I talk of a philosophy being fashionable, I'm speaking of its catching on not only with a lot of academics, but with writers of all kinds, novelists, playwrights, poets, journalists, so that it begins to pervade the whole cultural atmosphere of the time. In post-war France, there seemed to be existentialist novels, films, plays, and even conversation on all sides. The most famous name associated with that development, both then and now, is that of Jean-Paul Sartre. But the existentialism of this century really began not in France, but in Germany, and in the period following the First World War. And in serious terms, the most significant figure of the movement is not Sartre, but Heidegger. That's to say, there's virtual unanimity among students of modern existentialism that Heidegger, as well as preceding Sartre in time, is the more profound and more original thinker. So, in this program, we're going to approach modern existentialism chiefly through the work of Heidegger, though later on we shall have a bit to say about Sartre and how he fits into the picture. Martin Heidegger was born in southern Germany in 1889 and lived in the same small area of Europe for virtually the whole of his life. He studied under the famous philosopher Husserl before himself becoming a professional teacher of philosophy. In 1927, at the age of 38, he published his most important book called Being and Time. He was to live for getting on for another half century after that, and he wrote a great deal more, some of it very interesting. But nothing else of his was ever to be as big, or as good, or as influential as Being and Time. It's not an easy book to read, but we have here to talk about it the author of what I think is the best of all introductions to existentialism for the general reader. William Barrett, Professor of Philosophy at New York University and author of that excellent book, Irrational Man. Professor Barrett, if you can imagine for the moment that I'm somebody who knows absolutely nothing at all about the philosophy of Martin Heidegger and you were going to start setting about giving me some basic idea, how would you begin? I, I think I would try to locate the man in his historical context to begin with. It would be a little bigger context than the one you indicate, namely it wouldn't be measured in terms of decades, but centuries. And I'd, li I'd try to locate him first in relation to the, let's say the whole epoch of modern philosophy, which begins with Descartes. It was rather interesting to place him in, in, in that context because it relates him and differentiates him from other philosophers in the 20th century. Now, as you know, Descartes <clears throat> was one of the founders of the new science, that is, of modern physics. And part of his scheme for launching this science depended upon a certain kind of split between consciousness and the external world. The mind schematized nature for quantitative measures, uh, for calculation, for the purpose of manipulating nature, and at the same time, the human subject, the consciousness doing that, was set off against it. So you've, what came out of it was a certain kind of dualism between mind and the external world. Now, most philosophy, nearly all philosophy, in the subsequent two centuries, accommodated itself to the Cartesian framework. Uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of this century, a number of philosophers began to feel that, in some sense, it was uncomfortable. And we find that the, a kind of revolt or rebellion against Cartesianism <laughs> takes place among different schools, both in England and on the continent, as a matter of fact, with the American pragmatists too. Now, Heidegger is one of those rebels against Descartes. And if you stop to think of it, <clears throat> In this rebellion against Descartes, I think <clears throat> we would get the key idea of Heidegger's philosophy with which I would, would want to start educating somebody in the philosophy. May, let me make sure yes. that, 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 so to speak, we're, yes. we're together up to this yes, starting right. point. What you're saying, in effect, is this, that 
Uh, with the development of yeah. modern science, which really began in the 16th century, we get this, the development of the assumption that there is somehow a split in reality between subject and object. Yes. There are <clears throat> humans observing the world, and there is the world which they are observing. Right. And this dualism, this assumption that there is a division in reality between subject and object, yes. goes all the way through our science and all the way through our philosophy. Right. Though in fact, contrary to what probably most Western men and women suppose, it's really a, a view of reality which is peculiar to the West and peculiar to the last four or five centuries. Right. Right. Now, now, now it's I, an uncomfortable <laughs> view because there is, in some sense, we don't live with this view. I don't, I don't consider you as a mind attached to a body or I don't consider that I'm conscious of you there but I infer your existence, your existence is, is doubtful. In ordinary life, we move back and forth between mind and body in perfectly recognizable fashion without proposing to ourselves any particular philosophical puzzles in, 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 in these transactions. So that it, it becomes somehow contrary to our ordinary feel of things to proceed in this way as if the mind and the external world were set off against each other in this way. And this revolt against dualism, I think, is one of the features of 20th century philosophy, and Heidegger has his own mode of dealing with it. I think uh, you and I are together in the same world. I mean, you're not a mind attached to a body, and I'm not a mind attached to a body primarily. We're two human beings within the same world. So you asked me, how would you start introducing somebody, uh, someone to Heidegger's philosophy? I would, I would say you start with this fundamental concept of being in the world, that we are beings in the world. <clears throat> of course, now, the word being makes us recoil because it sounds very far-fetched mm -hmm. and highfalutin. But in the primary cases, in this case, we have to understand it in the most mundane, factual, ordinary, everyday sense, the way in which average, ordinary, or extraordinary human beings are concretely in the world. That's where we start from. And that's what, where we begin to philosophize. But. May I say that I find this a very congenial starting point because the notion that reality is split mm. between observer and observed or subject and object mm. isn't something that ever presented itself naturally to me. It was something I had to learn, so mm -hmm. to speak, in school or as a student. And at first I thought it a very strange idea. I think that the experience of the individual accords much more with what you are yeah. now saying. That is to say, we, we emerge from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, so to speak, to find ourselves as beings in a world, which is the phrase you just yes. used. We just find ourselves here in this world, and, the split and that's between, where we start. Yes. Well, the split between subject and object doesn't appear in philosophy until you get really at formulating Descartes. It's unknown to the Greeks and the medieval philosophers. Oh. But now, having, uh, having established the difference between uh, Heidegger and the tradition, mm -hmm. how does Heidegger then proceed? What does he, how does he proceed to formulate his problem? Well, you see, the, the, once you're planted in, in, in the world, we are beings of the world, then the task of philosophy becomes primarily one of, of description. You are, uh, the philosopher then aims to describe the various modes or ways in which we exist within this world. Now, in, in, in this respect, you see, Heidegger's approach is a little different from some of the anti-Cartesian rebels in British philosophy, let's say Moore or Wittgenstein, who start with very definite problems of knowledge and perception. How do we know the external world and so on? Now, <clears throat> what I would like to say is that you see that in, in this respect, when you propose an epistemological question, you are already in the world to propose it. Your ticket of admission to the ordinary world is not contingent upon your solving that puzzle. When you say epistemological, you mean anything to do with the theory of knowledge? Knowledge, of belief, perception, of knowledge. Yes. and so on. Yes. So that uh, knowledge is, is simply one other mode of our being in the world. And the various modes in which we are in the world. I mean, some of them are... <clears throat> a much more urgent and less theoretical form of knowledge. We are in the world in various fashions. We are anxiety-ridden sometimes. We're worried. Does we're the name concerned. existentialism imply that the existentialist philosophers see existence as a problem? 
it's a problem since we have to cope with it, but it's, it's the given in any case. I mean, it's not inferred, but the, the, the problem is then to characterize it descriptively. I think it's quite important to, to emphasize, apropos of Heidegger, that his, his aim is descriptive. He is not a speculative metaphysician. He's not, he's not erecting any abstract speculative um, theory about what ultimate reality is. If his, if his ideas stand or fall, they stand or fall in terms of whether they're adequately the, the adequately described, you see, our actual experience. Would, would you agree with this formulation, that throughout the uh, history of Western philosophy, mm. um, the central problem, really, of our whole philosophical tradition has been the problem of knowledge. Mm. What is it to know? What do we know? How do we know that we know? Yeah. How can we be sure, etc.? That is the, the key problem all the way through. But Heidegger isn't concerned with that problem centrally. He's concerned with the problem of what it is to be, right. what it is to exist. How is it that anything exists at all? What is this existence that we find no. ourselves in? And that's a quite different kind of problem, isn't it? Which exactly. fascinates some people, but I think is hard for other people to get hold of because it's unusual in a sense, it is unusual. in our tradition. But I'd, I'd like to point out that the the preempting of the central role in philosophy, the problem of knowledge, is really something which has characterized philosophy more or less since Descartes. I mean, it was discussed by earlier philosophers, but it did not yes. have quite that, that absolutely central place that it had after Descartes. So in some sense, it's a return. Uh, Heidegger thinks of himself in some sense as um, uh, a follower of the Greeks. But tradition. you say that what Heidegger is trying to do is to give a description of the reality in which we find ourselves, to give a, a description of being, of existence, mm. of what there is. Human existence. Human existence. Yes. But, I mean, a layman might ask, well, what's the point of this? I mean, we have this existence. Here we are. We are living it. It's, it's, it's in a sense, all we have. What is the point of describing uh, that which we are already having, or that with which we are already utterly familiar. What could, can a description of this give us that we haven't already got? Well, it's the familiar that usually eludes us in life. I mean, what's before our nose is what we see last. It's true that, that the features of human existence which he describes are, in many ways, commonplace when you get through with his analysis, but you haven't seen them quite in this way before. And I, I, I think it's the case that people don't see what's before them. They look past it or look through it in, in one way or another. And the um, adequate description of, of, uh, of experience would, in some sense, enlighten our eyes to what, what there is, and, which is not e e easy to see in all cases. Well, now, does, does this mean that, that there is, throughout Heidegger, uh, an emphasis on the everyday, on the yes, ordinary, the on the familiar? Yes in its familiar things, but there's also an, an emphasis on the extraordinary, the unusual. You see, if, if I compare Heidegger in this respect with another philosopher of the everyday, using that term in general sense, of, let's say the later Wittgenstein, the, the comparison is rather interesting in one respect, because Wittgenstein envisages the task of philosophy to be unraveling the snarls of our ordinary language, so that then we can continue functioning on the same plane let's say, the sort of level plane of uh, efficient communication within the world. Now, uh, in this sense, we almost envisage with Wittgenstein the possibility if we unraveled all the snarls in language, philosophy would disappear, or the problems or questions which set us into philosophy would disappear. But now, you see, in Heidegger's case, we move along that plane of ordinary reality, and there's suddenly all extraordinary gaps abrupt kinds of experiences which are very extraordinary. Well, now, I think we are getting Heidegger in our sight, so yes. to speak, but I think people watching this discussion yeah. will be beginning to ask themselves, well, yes, but what does he actually say? What does he talk about? What are his doctrines? Now, what are some of the central themes with which he's concerned? And let's start going into what he has to say right. about them. Right. Well, for example, the one characteristic of human existence in the We've talked a little bit about, you and I, this notion of what he calls the, the thrownness of human existence. The, the word in German looks very imposing, geworfenheit, literally thrownness, but it, it's a rather simple notion. We're thrown into the world. 
And uh, this is a case of w where what is most ordinary and banal um, it is nevertheless a quite extraordinary fact about our individual human destiny. Well, do we, we simply find ourselves we, here without, as it were, a by your leave or anyone well, having asked we did, us? We didn't pick our parents. Yes. We are born of yes. those parents. We are born at this particular time. We are born with whatever genetic structure is given to us. Mm -hmm. And this is the load we take upon us in order to fashion a life. In this sense, we are thrown or projected into a world. So that human life starts at the very, very beginning as a cast of the dice. Its contingency is rooted in the very fact of the inescapable facts of your individual birth and parentage, your individual time and history. We're born in the 20th century and not in some other And what does Heidegger century. have to say about that? Well, we begin our existence as a task in this sense, as something we take upon ourselves because you see, existence is not a neutral fact when you're concerned with human existence. Existence is ongoing. It has to be. We are always involved thus in the task of, as it were, creating ourselves. Always from this well, contingent moving factual Moving into basis. an open future right, all the time. Right. Yes. The future is the predominant tense in Heidegger. Because what, that he see, he, what he sees man as essentially, a, so to speak, an ongoing right. creature. Yes. And as a matter of fact, is is a count of we we construct the notion of clock time. We make watches and other chronometers because we're planning to use our time. So we're projecting ourselves into the future, and on that basis, we can calculate time. So the again the the dimension of time that is is most compelling for him is the future. In, 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 the sense that the present has meaning only insofar far as it opens toward a possible future. You were saying just now that Heidegger, in his attempts to give an illuminating description of our actual everyday yes. experience of life, is aware, you said, of the sudden holes in it. As yes. It were. What were you thinking? I mean, were you thinking of death? Were you, death, what were you yes, thinking would of? be one case. Yeah, what would be others? Well, now, in death, anxiety. He gives an analysis of conscience, but if we stop for a moment on, on death, I think mm. that's because mm. you asked me, mm. uh, how does this description give us something which we don't already know? Mm. And it's rather interesting that uh, the description of death he gives us is something which rather turns over our usual notions because our usual notions try very much to escape from the, the fact of death. Now, this is something very peculiar about death. It's, it's, um, we, we usually think of death as a fact in the world. We read about people dying, we read obituaries and so on. It happens to other people. To be sure, it'll happen to me, but not yet. So it's something out there in the world, ex as yet external to me. But the curious thing is, if I start to think of it as my death, you know, my death is, will never be a fact in the world for me. I will never read my obituary, which is, a, I think, a very significant little fact. So it can never be a public event in the world for me. Well, as Wittgenstein says, uh, death is not an experience right. in life yes. because we don't live to experience death. It's not exactly. something we live through, yes. and therefore not an experience we have. Yes, it's, mm. it, it's, it's not in that in My death is is as as an ascent, as essentially mine is something which. Uh, cannot be event, an event in the world for me, but it's a compelling possibility for me now. I mean, the meaning of death is that it is um, a present possibility. I may not be at any time. The, the meaning of death is that it's the possibility of not being, or it's, as he puts it, it's the possibility which cancels all my possibilities. Now, in this sense, it's the most extreme of possibilities, but his point is once you realize that this particular possibility inhabits your existence. It's sort of the warp and woof of it in some way. That uh, you can either collapse and uh, scurry away from it in fear, or you can face up to it. And then you ask yourself the question, there is that possibility. In the face of that possibility, what meaning does my life have? See, I think, I think for Heidegger, he would agree with Tolstoy that the fundamental, or at least 
at this stage of Heidegger's thinking, you would agree with Tolstoy, that the fundamental question that philosopher, as well as every man, has to put is this. Since there is death, what meaning does my life have? And, then, and that, I think, is, is where suddenly, if you think of it, death as this interior possibility, it takes on a new dimension from what it ordinarily carries, you see, when we sort of refer to so-and-so died and so-and-so mm. and -so mm. died and so on. I must say again, this is something that I find deeply congenial. Mm. Although I was trained in philosophy in an entirely different tradition from this, um, what everything you're saying makes very much sense to me. Yeah. I, I have I've very strongly this feeling, and I mm. suppose large numbers of people must have it, that our everyday life is at one and the same time sort of banal and... Mm -hmm over-familiar and uh, uh, platitudinous, yeah. and yet at the same time mysterious and extraordinary. Uh, I have that double feeling about life, and I certainly have very strongly the feeling that in the face of death one wants to seek mm -hmm. some meaning in right. one's existence. Now, having reached this point, does Heidegger call in aid a traditional uh, religious explanation of existence, or what does he do? No, he has no, no answer. All he's pointing out is the structure of human existence or the framework within which one has to pose these questions. He's showing that this is a, a dimension of human existence which has to be faced. What answer you give to the question, what meaning do I have, will depend upon the particular individual. I mean, Heidegger has no ethics in this sense. The one feature of human life which he does draw a great deal of attention to, in addition to this, what you called Gewurfenheit, no, yeah. the fact that we are flung into it and find ourselves in the middle of it, is the finitude of it, isn't it? Mm. I mean, not only do we just kind of wake up in the world and find ourselves here, but the whole situation lasts a very short time. I mean, we've scarcely got used to finding ourselves here, then it all stops again. Mm. And the fact that it all stops again is, for most human beings, as you were just saying, very frightening and very alarming. Mm. Um, what, how does he recommend that we proceed from there? No recipes. The point is, he, he points out that whatever, whatever decision you take to give your life meaning or to encounter death, it is the human condition that must be faced in one form or another. And perhaps, uh, I mean, he doesn't say this, but there's a suggestion of Tolstoy and others that perhaps all philosophy is a response to this question of death. There was Socrates' remark that all philosophy is a meditation on death, which we might in interpret liberally in this fashion. That man wouldn't philosophize if he didn't have to, have to face the fact of death. If we were all Adam living eternally in the Garden of Eden, we'd just saunter along in death ruminate about this or that, but not any serious philosophical issue. One thing that Heidegger and the existentialists face, which I think previous philosophers didn't face, is the fact that our knowledge of death induces anxiety. It's mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. We are frightened right. when we try to look in the yeah. eye the mm -hmm. fact that we are going to die. Yeah. And so anxiety in the face of our own finitude or mortality becomes one of the central themes of existentialist philosophy, isn't yes. it? And I, I, I think it, it, it's important to see that this place is a, what I consider a, a fundamentally a sound and healthy um, assessment on the fact of, of anxiety. Anxiety is sort of led a checkered career in modern culture. I mean, it became fashionable a few decades ago. I remember when Auden wrote his book, The Age of Anxiety. Um, well, it seemed to be the, the thing that was fashionable. It was the in thing. People went around cultivating their anxieties and so on, which is rather silly because if, if we've followed our previous um, description of, of death, we realize that anxiety is there anyway. As a matter of fact, anxiety is, is simply our human existence in its contingency coming to the level of consciousness. It is the sheer contingency of human existence sort of vibrating there through it. On the other hand, you see the other modern attitude, which is partly the result of our being a technical society, which commands certain instruments. We have a command of drugs or remedies of various kinds. We imagine that there should be some instrument or means by which we can simply press a button and get rid of our anxieties, that they're not something which, uh, which have to be faced and lived through. And uh, I think either extreme is rather 
unfortunate. And it is simply part of the condition of, of being human. And in a certain sense, at one point, Heidegger says, well, there are all sorts of modes of anxiety. And, and uh, in some forms, it has the kind of peacefulness of a creative yearning. If we weren't anxious, we would never create anything. But man's, man's uh, attempt to evade, to, so to speak, run away from his own anxiety, to evade the reality of his own mortality, leads, doesn't it, to the next uh, existentialist theme, namely alienation, mm. that we, we avert our eyes from the, from the stark reality of our own existence and, in a sense, cease to participate in the realities of our own existence. Now, this is something that existentialist philosophers have a great deal to say yes. about, too. And another term, like, like the term anxiety, which has become much misused by sort of fashionable and trendy writers. Yes. Would you agree with that? Yes. As a matter of fact, alienation is unfortunate. One of the terms that's been tossed around so that if the word is used, people will say, oh, that boring subject, you see, because it's not. But it does happen, nevertheless, to be one of the deepest themes of modern culture. And it, and it preoccupied Hegel, Marx, and I think it's been a, a main item in contemporary literature, literature of the 20th century. Now, Heidegger's point, you see, perfectly validated, the mere fact that we have uh, a civilization which has a great deal of means of information at its disposal, so people know what's in or what's out, what's going. So the word alienation is tossed around, and the, the mere fact that we make it into an empty banality, in a sense, promotes our alienation. It's one of the yes. causes. I mean, one way of escaping yes. anxiety is not to yes. take it seriously, right. to make it frivolous right. or trendy right. or... Yes. 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 Well, he's alienated, yes. so what? Yeah. But, um, but uh, see, alienation occurs for Heidegger on several levels. One, one is this level in which we may lose ourselves in the impersonal social self. A man buries himself in his persona, his social role, and so on. As a matter of fact, Sartre took that from him and uh, developed it well, really like the, very well. The, the words with poem, the world is too much oh, with yes, us, indeed. late and soon, getting yes. and spending, we yes. may waste our powers, etc. But you see, alienation is, is really quite a real problem in this sense. I, I must say, I, I have a feeling of, of, very acutely for the moment, um, I'm putting this slightly humorously, but I think you will understand this. Here I descended from the skies into uh, London, and I haven't quite found myself, and it seems rather strange. The alienation You feel is, slightly detached from yes, reality. Yes, and I, as I walk yes. the streets, these are strange people in certain ways. Yeah. A couple of more days, and I probably feel at home. Yeah. Uh, uh, fundamentally, the word uh, alienation, of course, means mm. Something you said, we all, we strange, all feel like that stranger. in strange cities, yes. but some people feel like that in the world, don't they? Uh, yes. Permanently. They, they inhabit their own skins as, as, yeah. as strangers. Yeah. 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 Now, I want to move on. We've been talking so far about the basic themes of being and time, yeah. and I think it will strike uh, people listening to this discussion straight away that this is a book which deals with very fundamental themes which do exercise people at a very deep level. And even if there are no answers, I think the, the fact that it illuminates the questions, which it certainly yes. does, or at least it certainly has for me, is of it, in itself something of enormous value. But like so many other philosophers, having worked out a big philosophy young, he then moved on and in some sense away, didn't he, from his early concerns. For example, Being and Time is the first, or it's presented as being the first volume of what is to be a two-volume work. Mm -hmm. But the second volume never came out. So all we ever have is this first half of a book. Why didn't he finish that initial program? And why did he then go on to do unexpected and unforeseen things? Oh, this is a subject of both discussion and speculation. It turns out from recent information I've had just a month or so ago in the United States that Heidegger has left the manuscript of the second part. Which he, he, he himself. Oh, so it does said, exist but, and it will be published. I don't know. It'll be published as a kind of a knock glass of, of something he's left behind. But it, I don't think it was publishable. I myself tend to think that I know what he was going to say in that. And he said it in his book on Kant and a few essays. Since. But then there occurs this thing which is the Heideggerian scholars called the care the turn. Um, he felt, in some sense, that in being in time, he had riveted his attention too exclusively on man, and that uh, this this philosophy was a, a, 
a powerful form of humanism, but there was no, there was no systematic grasp of what the human being is rooted in. And uh, of course, well, the world of nature, you yes, know, the material world, the cosmos. Yes, the cosmos. In a sense, yes. You see, in a sense, Heidegger, I would say, is a follower of Parmenides. You see, the, the the this Greek sage who had this electrifying idea of you see, the all is one. For the first time in in, in human history, the notion of the the totality of being as one thing, you see, which to which we have to relate ourselves in our thinking. And Heidegger is written about Parmenides, but it, now in in this sense, he feels that precisely what has happened with modern cultures, we've lost those cosmic roots in a way, that we've been detached from the sense of our connection with the whole or the all. Why should the, this have happened specifically in modern culture? Isn't it part of the human condition as such? It, it is part in, in the sense that man is a being who flies away from truth even as he pursues it. But I think one of the reasons it happens specifically in modern cultures, of course, we, we build up a much more intricate technical society. We're more encased in the sheer human framework of things than people were at one well, time. Simply because we live in a much more complex, complicated right. We live surrounding. in an air-conditioned nightmare, to borrow mm. Mm. the term mm. of Henry Miller. But we live more and more in a, a man-created environment, if we consider it all down the line from our yeah. air conditioning yeah. to everything else and our uh, urban complexes I mean I can't help but think coming to London that London is a very different city from Shakespeare's London which existed that much closer to the countryside you could probably yeah. you know very short and walk out and yeah so. yeah well what are the main themes then of the later Heidegger as distinct from the earlier yes well you see the later Heidegger is is not systematic or not even systematic in, in the way in which he attempts to be in being in time. The later Heidegger is primarily, or not primarily, but very centrally concerned with the problem of poetry and art. And in some sense, you see, and, and the problem of technology. Um, <clears throat> Heidegger feels that, or felt since he's, he's dead now, the, um, one of the uh, tasks of philosophers in, 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 in this period is to try to think through what technology involves. He felt that I think modern thinking is either too superficial, too in, inauthentic with regard to the subject of technology. You know, on one hand, you find people very flippant attitude. They're against machines or they're for technology. It makes no sense, he said, for a man at this particular juncture of history to be for or against technology. We're obviously committed to technology. I mean, if you removed it, the whole thing would collapse. We are. That's, that's part of the stake of our existence. It's part of our gamble. On the other hand, you see, there is a point which I think the atomic bomb has brought forth for human consciousness generally, that technology has drastic possibilities. It's, hitherto people have protested against it as local nuisances or causing unemployment, sabotage, and so on. But the notion that suddenly mankind could self-destruct suddenly showed us the, the fearful possibilities within the technical complex. And now he, Heidegger was concerned with thinking through where in the historical destiny of man the, the roots of, of his technical being lie, lie and where it may possibly be carrying him. You see? But how does, how does his concern with poetry relate to his concern with technology? Unless he sees these yeah. as two opposite sides of the opposite. same kind. They are kind. opposite. Yeah. Because uh, the thing, well, as you well know from other branches of contemporary philosophy, there's a certain disposition on the part of some philosophers when they're examining language to treat it as a calculus. It's an instrument which can be manipulated and controlled. It's a formal calculus and so on. And in this sense, this represents an extension of technical thinking, you see, even to the domain of language. Now, the thing about a, a poem in Heidegger's view is that it eludes uh, the demands of our will. We cannot, the poet cannot will to write a poem. He cannot will it. It comes. And actually, we as his readers can't will our response. We have to submit to it and be passive to it. You see, along, what Heidegger connects the, the technological uh, center of this civilization is with its 
Faustian will, which becomes eventually the Nietzschean will, the will to power. It goes right back to man, man's determination right. to master nature, right. which is the basis of our whole modern exactly. culture, modern exactly. technology, modern science, and so on, which yes, he I'm, is in rebellion against. And, and if I, if I, I think the key quotation here would be Francis Bacon. We must learn, the, oh, who is uh, I'm really a prophet of the new science in this respect. Mm. I always think of Bacon in this respect as being um, a publicity man for the new science, but a publicity man of genius. He says, we must put nature to the rack to compel it to answer our questions, which is a very d d dramatic way of, of endorsing the experimental method. But now you stop to think, you know, even if we put poor nature to the rack, poor tortured nature, we have to listen. <laughs> to our responses. Mm -hmm. We have, in some sense, to give ourselves a receptive. There's a point at which mm -hmm. our twisting, you see, has to submit to, to whatever is there to be. This really does absorbed. represent a basic uh, break with, yeah. with the tradition, doesn't it? Because even, as it were, revolutionary philosophies within the tradition, like Marxism, for example, take it for granted that the conquest of nature is man's business. Mm -hmm. It's what human life is all about and right. what social life right. is all about. I must say that speaking just purely personally for a yes. moment, that in uh, all the, uh, the preparation that this television series has involved me in, the preparation I've done for this discussion and this program has taught me most because uh, I found in Heidegger, who I knew very little about before, all kinds of illuminating insights in these very fundamental themes mm -hmm. we've been discussing. And that being so, this is leading me to the point I want to put to you, I can't help wondering why it is that other philosophers, including very able and prestigious ones like mm. A.J. Eyre mm. or Karl Popper or Rudolf Carnap, mm. all sorts of people, pour scorn on Heidegger and the kind of philosophy that he's trying to do. They dismiss it, they've dismissed it in their published writings as nonsense, rubbish, garbage, it's all a lot of rhetoric, it's all mm. a lot of words. Yes. Seems to me you've only got to read the stuff for five minutes mm. to see that it isn't yeah. just all a lot of words. Now, why has it been so derisively dismissed by so many such able people? Well, I don't want to make an invidious remark about a philosophy in the state of philosophy, but there is a certain kind of professional deformation. A, a, a man has a certain vision, and he carries with this uh, sort of blindness to somebody else's mm. uh, vision. Uh, I think one of the things is that Heidegger's vo vocabulary, you see, is, is um, initially rather jarring. And uh, but if I think if you read him in German, he writes a fairly straightforward German and. Uh, it was certainly, if you compare his, him as uh, his German prose with that, let's say, of Hegel, it seems to me Heidegger's lucidity itself. But um, I, I think what we do find in philosophy is that uh, there's a certain prejudice for certain chosen vocabularies. Now, you mentioned Carnap. I was a student of Carnap for several years, you say. And I'm, I, I got interested partly in Heidegger to find out what the fuss was. Could he be as bad as they said? Well, you came to Heidegger through Carnap's attacks on Heidegger. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And uh, yes. And, uh, and when you read Heidegger, you discovered that I he wasn't interested. as bad as they yes. said. Yes. 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 But so, uh, Professor Barrett, uh, in, when I was introducing this program, I promised our viewers that we would say something about Sartre, and yes. I think that before we come to an end, I I, I really do want to uh, ask you if you if we can move on to him just yes. for a moment. Um, Although Sartre has become, as it were, the most famous existentialist, his is the name that most people associate with existentialism, mm. he's not as original a thinker as Heidegger, is he? But nevertheless, he has made a contribution. What would you characterize as being Sartre's main contribution? Well, there are a number of ways um, which you can characterize that, but I'd like to contrast them first. Perhaps that might perhaps point the direction which his, his um, contribution has come. You see, Sartre's uh, big book, his major philosophical work, and I personally think, by the way, some of his novels and plays are more important than, than any of his philosophical writing, but I think he's a, still a philosopher of considerable brilliance. But his major work is called Being and Nothingness. It's a gigantic misnomer. Um, it's not about being, and it's not about nothingness. Uh, Sartre doesn't have much of a feeling for being. Whatever, whatever one may object to in Heidegger, one has to acknowledge that man is really saturated with 
the sense of being in some sense. What Sartre's book is, a, is about is really the kind of melodrama of two Cartesian consciousnesses. And naturally, they are Cartesian because he's French. Every Frenchman is a Cartesian, I think, when he's, he's pushed far enough. And these, these two consciousnesses never understand each other. That is, they are two subjectivistic minds uh, who misinterpret each other. I, as subject, impose upon you and convert you into an object and so on, and you reciprocate. And so this fiendish dialogue of misrepresentation goes on, and misunderstanding and so forth. In the end, it becomes impossible for us to communicate sin sincerely. This big book of Sartre is really a book on the problem of sincerity, which is the staple, I think, of French literature, from Montaigne right through Molière and Proust and so on. Now, the, but to come to, to, you see, Sartre's then most famous positive doctrine is its notion of, of liberty, and it's the doctrine which actually, I think, caught on most in public art, that as, as human beings, we have an absolute and total freedom. Nothing prevents us at a certain moment from, for, from doing some very precipitous well, I am and dangerous the, thing. I am in the literal sense free now to take all my clothes off or right. go and jump out of the window. Right. Or I can actually yes. do these yes. things. Yes. And one thing Sartre keeps stressing is that by pretending that I am not free to do them, I'm falsifying the reality right. of my own situation. Yes. So I stand on a precipice at any moment and I can hurl myself mm. off it. And in this sense, the characteristic of this total freedom is that it's, it's vertiginous or dizzying. And he, he carries through this metaphor of standing on a cliff and having this dizzy sense of being able to cast yourself down. Nothing right, prevents you. Isn't he right to dramatize in this way the fact that the realities of choice which we have in yes. life and the realities yes. of freedom that we have in life are in fact much greater than we ourselves wish to yes. face for most of the time? Except now, here's where you see, I think, Heidegger has an insight which is beyond be him in this respect. Because the individual who hurls himself into this precipitous choice may, in tearing off in that sudden direction, be, remain utterly as blind as when he started. You see, now, it's rather curious that Heidegger's view of a freedom is a very quiet one and, and subtle and soft. It, our fundamental freedom is the freedom, if we can manage it, to become open, to let truth happen. And uh, most of us in our lives are, are shut off in our personal lives in one way or another, doesn't mm. matter which, mm. from uh, truth in our dealings with other people. We have uh, resistances which can't be breached and so on. But sometimes there is a fissure in this wall that shuts us off and we are able to let be. We no longer seek to compel or, or. You see, the whole of he the later Heidegger is really a, a prolonged attack on the will to power as characterizing Western civilization. An attack on this, this urge yes. we have to dominate nature, right. and even, dominate our environment. And even the, dominate our own personal lives or dominate yes. other people. The view being that you only really understand reality when in some sense you submit yourself to right. it. Summing up, Professor Barrett, taking Heidegger and Sartre, and indeed the whole existentialist mm. tradition together, if you were asked to say, well, now, what contribution has this made to human thought in our time, mm. what would you stress? What have we got from it all? I'll, I'll, I'll stress an academic point f first, and then the more important human point follow. I think... Um, from the point of view of the history of thought or the history of philosophy, uh, existentialism has brought forward a kind of re-evaluation of 19th century thought. For one thing, it, it has exhumed Kierkegaard, who was virtually unknown in English-speaking uh, countries. It's established him as a, as a major thinker. I don't know whether you'd call him a philosopher, but a thinker of, of considerable proportions and power in the 19th century. One of the major figures of the of the century. As a matter of fact, Wittgenstein said of Kierkegaard, he thought he was the greatest writer of the 19th century, which is rather mm -hmm. interesting. Kier um, Wittgenstein had discovered Kierkegaard quite early, before existentialism, in, in, toward the end of the World War I. But um, the second point I think that's made aware, uh, made people aware of like that, 
modern society tends to depersonalize to a certain extent. That we, it gets larger and larger, more intricately organized, and so on. And that the problem of the person, the individual, as a unique being who cannot be completely assimilated into any framework, whether it's bureaucratic or conceptual or systematic, something of him is left out. I think this is, this kind of emphasis is what uh, it, 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 it has brought forward, I think, most powerfully. Thank you very much, Professor Barrett. Humans observing the world, mm -hmm. and there is the world which they are observing. Right. And this dualism, this assumption that there is a division in reality between subject and object, yes. goes all the way through our science and all the way through our philosophy. Right. Though, in fact, contrary to what probably most Western men and women suppose, it's really a, a view of reality which is peculiar to the West and peculiar to the last four or five centuries. Right. Right. Now... Now, now it's an uncomfortable view because there is, in some sense, we don't live with this view. I don't, I don't consider you as a mind attached to a body, or I don't consider that I'm conscious of you there, but I infer your existence. Your existence is, is doubtful. In ordinary life, we move back and forth between mind and body in perfectly recognizable fashion without proposing to ourselves any particular philosophical puzzles. In, in, in these transactions. So that it, it becomes somehow contrary to our ordinary feel of things to proceed in this way as if the mind and the external world were set off against each other in this way. And this revolt against dualism, I think, is one of the features of 20th century philosophy. And Heidegger has his own mode of dealing with it. I think uh, <clears throat> you and I are together in the same world. I mean, you're not a mind attached to a body, and I'm not a mind attached to a body. Primarily, we're two human beings within the same world. So you asked me, how would you start introducing somebody, uh, someone to Heidegger's philosophy? I would, I would say you start with this. Philosopher Husserl, before himself becoming a professional teacher of philosophy. In 1927, at the age of 38, he published his most important book called Being and Time. He was to live for getting on for another half century after that, and he wrote a great deal more, some of it very interesting. But nothing else of his was ever to be as big, or as good, or as influential as Being and Time. It's not an easy book to read, but we have here to talk about it the author of what I think is the best of all introductions to existentialism for the general reader. William Barrett, professor of philosophy at New York University and author of that excellent book, Irrational Man. Professor Barrett, if you can imagine for the moment that I'm somebody who knows absolutely nothing at all about the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, and you were going to start setting about giving me some basic idea, how would you begin? I, I think I would try to locate the man in his historical context to begin with. It would be a little bigger context than the one you indicate. Namely, it wouldn't be measured in terms of decades, but centuries. And I'd, li I'd try to locate him first in relation to the, let's say, the whole epoch of modern philosophy, which begins with Descartes. It was rather interesting to place him in, in, in that context because it relates him and differentiates him from other philosophers in the 20th century. Now, as you know, Descartes <clears throat> was one of the founders of the new science, that is, of modern physics. And part of his scheme for launching this science depended upon a certain kind of fundamental concept of being in the world, that we are beings in the world. <clears throat> of course, now, the word being makes us recoil because it sounds very far-fetched mm -hmm. and highfalutin. But in the primary cases, in this case, we have to understand it in the most mundane, factual, ordinary, everyday sense. The way in which average, ordinary, or extraordinary human beings are concretely in the world. That's where we start from, and that's what, where we begin to philosophize. But May I say that I find this a very congenial starting point, because the notion that reality is split mm. between observer and observed, or subject and object, mm. isn't something that ever presented itself naturally to me. It was something I had to learn, mm -hmm. so to speak, in school or as a student. And at first, I thought it a very strange idea. I think that the 
experience of the individual accords much more with what you are yeah. now saying. That is to say, we, we emerge from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, so to speak, to find ourselves as beings in a world, which is the phrase you just yes. used. We just find ourselves here in this world, and, the split and that's between, where we start. Yes. Well, the split between subject and object doesn't appear in philosophy until you get, really, at formula in Descartes. It's unknown to the Greeks and the medieval philosophers. Oh. But no, having, uh, having established the difference between uh, Heidegger and the tradition, mm -hmm. how does Heidegger then proceed? What does he, how does he proceed to formulate his problem? Well, you see, the, the, once you're planted in, in, in the world, we are beings of the world, then the task of philosophy becomes primarily one of, of description. You, uh, the philosopher then aims to describe the various modes or ways and when of split between consciousness and the external world. The mind schematized nature for quantitative measures, uh, for calculation, for the purpose of manipulating nature, and at the same time, the human subject, the consciousness doing that, was set off against it. So you've, what came out of it was a certain kind of dualism between mind and the external world. Now, most philosophy, nearly all philosophy, in the subsequent two centuries, accommodated itself to the Cartesian framework. Uh, <clears throat> At the beginning of this century, a number of philosophers began to feel that, in some sense, it was uncomfortable. And we find that the, a kind of revolt or rebellion against Cartesianism <laughs> takes place among different schools, both in England and on the continent, as a matter of fact, with the American pragmatists, too. Now, Heidegger is one of those rebels against Descartes. And if you stop to think of it, <clears throat> In this rebellion against Descartes, I think <clears throat> we would get the key idea of Heidegger's philosophy with which I would, would want to start educating somebody in the philosophy. May, let me make sure yes. that, 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 so to speak, we're, yes. we're together up to this yes, starting right. point. What you're saying, in effect, is this, that uh, with the development of yeah. modern science, which really began in the 16th century, we get this, the development of the assumption that there is somehow a split in reality between subject and object. Yes. There are... <clears throat> Every now and again, a serious philosophy sweeps belatedly into intellectual fashion, usually as a result of some particular set of circumstances. Between the two world wars, this happened to Marxism, mainly as a result of the Russian Revolution. After the Second World War, it happened to existentialism, the fashion for which began on the continent of Europe in response largely to the experience of Nazi occupation. When I talk of a philosophy being fashionable, I'm speaking of its catching on not only with a lot of academics, but with writers of all kinds, novelists, playwrights, poets, journalists, so that it begins to pervade the whole cultural atmosphere of the time. In post-war France, there seemed to be existentialist novels, films, plays, and even conversation on all sides. The most famous name associated with that development, both then and now, is that of Jean-Paul Sartre. But the existentialism of this century really began not in France, but in Germany, and in the period following the First World War. And in serious terms, the most significant figure of the movement is not Sartre, but Heidegger. That's to say, there's virtual unanimity among students of modern existentialism that Heidegger, as well as preceding Sartre in time, is the more profound and more original thinker. So, in this program, we're going to approach modern existentialism chiefly through the work of Heidegger, though later on we shall have a bit to say about Sartre and how he fits into the picture. Martin Heidegger was born in southern Germany in 1889 and lived in the same small area of Europe for virtually the whole of his life. He studied under the famous philosopher